Praise the Lord. I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me for our scripture reading for our sermon text today. And today we're going to be in 1 John chapter 3. A couple weeks ago, I did a sermon on 1 John 3, 16 as part of our top 316s series. This week I want to go forward in chapter 3. And we're going to look together at 1 John 3, verses 21 to 24. I'm asking if you'll please stand for the reading of Holy Scripture. 1 John chapter 3, verses 21 to 24. This is God's holy word for us, His people. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from Him, because we keep His commandments and do what pleases Him. And this is His commandment, that we believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as He has commanded us. Whoever keeps His commandments abides in God and God in Him. And by this we know that He abides in us by the Spirit whom He has given us. This is God's holy word for us, His people. Let's ask Him to bless our time in His word. Almighty God, our Father, these are not simply the words of a man who lived 2,000 years ago, the words of John, but these are the eternal words that you inspired and that you've given to us for us today. And we ask that you would bless the reading of your word, and now especially the preaching. May you open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts to receive all you have for us today. Write your truth upon our hearts, and let us go from here ready and willing to believe what you call us to believe and do what you call us to do. For your glory, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Have you ever been nervous or intimidated or scared to ask someone a question? Maybe if you, you're, you've been intimidated to ask your boss for a raise or for time off when you're over the limit. Maybe you get nervous about asking the waiter to take your plate back to the kitchen and have him reorder it. You know, what if, what if she spits in my food? What if, you know, you know, I get like this. I mean, I've, I've told you about when I was at a restaurant with my uh, mom and dad and sister and they, and they brought out a... I ordered a steak, and they brought it out, and, and uh, it was supposed to be a sirloin. And best I could tell, it was mostly just cartilage, just almost no meat, just fat. And, uh, and I remarked to my parents, uh, because they, they looked at me like, why aren't you eating your steak? And I said, well, I didn't know they were going to bring me the cow's knee. <laughs> it just it, one big ligament, you know, and I couldn't eat it. Well, why don't you send it back? No, no, I don't want to. Uh. Yeah, are you like me? You get kind of nervous, like, man, I don't want to bother the chef. He's got a lot of other orders to make. And, uh, yeah, yeah, I'll just eat the potatoes. I don't have to worry about it. You, know, you get kind of nervous about asking maybe a waiter to take the food back. Or maybe you get nervous when you ask someone to move out of your way in the aisle. Oh, I'll just go around. I don't want to bother him. He looks kind of mean. I don't you know, what if he's rude? What if, she, what if she just, what if she's like, you know, take a hike? You know, and you can, can you know, I'll just go around. I won't bother him. Never mind. Uh, maybe you get nervous if, you know, you're asking a girl out on a date or, you know, if you're asking your fiance, you know, when are you going to propose? <laughs> you get nervous about some of these things. You might get nervous about asking a friend or family member for money or for a favor might get nervous asking a spouse to change his or her habits or attitude. Why do you keep leaving your towel over there? Why don't you put that up? Why do you keep doing this and that? 
there are situations that all of us, some situation that all of us can get in sometimes that makes us nervous about asking someone for something. And we often feel such trepidation because we're unsure of the outcome and we're apprehensive of the person's response. And this is what it feels like to ask a question, to ask somebody for something with no confidence, to make a request that lacks confidence. And sometimes, isn't it true, sometimes this can carry over into our prayer lives. Sometimes we can find ourselves unsure, apprehensive, hesitant, and insecure in our relationship with God. We can develop a shaky relationship with the Lord where our prayers and requests are doubtful and fearful. Well, in our passage this morning, John gives us the key to having a confident prayer life. In order to get to a point of spiritual growth and maturity where you can make a confident request in prayer to God, and really know He's listening, and to know you're on the same page, to know you're in sync with the Lord, and you don't have to think, well, why would He care about this? Or why should I expect Him to listen to this prayer? Or how do you get past all that? How do you get to that point of spiritual growth and maturity where you can have confidence in your prayer life? Well, we need at least two things that John gives us in this passage. We need to have a committed walk, and we need to have a convincing spirit. A committed walk in a convincing spirit. And so let's look at these two things first, and then we'll conclude by considering what a confident request looks like. So let's begin with a committed walk, the first step in having a confident prayer life. Let's look at verses 21 and 22. John says, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. If our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from Him. Why? Because we keep His commandments and do what pleases Him. How do we have confidence before God in our prayer life? The first thing you need is a heart that does not condemn us. An uncondemned heart before the Lord. If our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. So our hearts need to be reassured before God. Our hearts need confidence before the Lord. That's the first step of a committed walk is having a heart that does not feel itself condemned before God, but feels confident before God. How on earth do we get that? I want a heart that's confident before the Lord and not fearful and doubtful. Where does that come from? Well, it comes from a lot of places, and John gives us some help. The first thing that we need to have an uncondemned heart, a heart that is assured and secured before God, is described for us earlier in the passage. Let's back up to 3.16 and go forward. John says in 3.16, By this we know love, that he, talking about Christ, laid down his life for us. This is, what we know, this is how we know what love is. He laid down His life for us, and so we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers, for our fellow believers, our brothers and sisters in Christ. And then he says in verse 17, If anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? So we need to have an open heart, a loving heart, a generous giving heart that loves our neighbor. And then verse 18 says, Little children, let us not love in word or talk. Let's not just talk a big love game. Let's walk it out. 
Lo let us love in, not in word and talk, but in deed, in our actions, and in truth, true love. Love in deed, not just in talk. And then verse 19 says, By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. By this we'll know we're of the truth, we're of the true kind of love, verse 18. And this will reassure our hearts before God. So if you have the love of Christ for your neighbor, an open heart towards your neighbor, not a closed heart towards your neighbor, you can have confidence that you have been born of God. John repeats this in chapter 4, verse 7. He says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. So you see the logic. When God's love lands on you and grips your heart and moves your heart, when it melts your heart of stone and it convinces your heart that God is love and his love burns for you and the evidence, the proof is that he gave Christ for you. When you see yourself so loved by God, it melts that old heart of stone. It fills it up with a desire not just to drink that love in but to pour that love out. And you become a conduit of God's love. God has so loved me, how could I close off my heart by, and not extend that love to my neighbor who's in need? God doesn't need my love. He didn't have to make me. He didn't have to save me. He doesn't need me. God doesn't need my love. He, he wants it, but he doesn't need it. The, per, the, the one who needs it is my neighbor. And so my love and my good deeds flow out to my neighbor. Let us love in truth and in deed. And it's towards your neighbor. So if you're walking in love, if you've experienced the love of God in your own life, in your own heart, and you're extending that love to others, the way that love should naturally move you to do, then, it, John says, by this we'll know that we're of the truth, and it will reassure our heart before him. Your love for others is the evidence that you've come to know God's love for you. John says more about this in chapter 4, verses 16 through 19. He says, So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. We've come to know it. We've come to believe it, to trust in it. And so we've come to know and to believe the love God has for us, God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence. So that we may have confidence, not just in our prayer lives, but for the day of judgment. You can have a heart that's not just confident enough to ask things from God in prayer. You have a heart that's confident enough to stand before Him in the judgment and know that His love for you has taken away all of your condemnation. You can be assured on the day of judgment because as He is, so also are we in this world. And then He says this, verse 18, chapter 4, verse 18, There is no fear in love. But perfect love, God's love, casts out our fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. So if you know the love of God, it banishes that fear you have, that trepidation, that timidness, the apprehensiveness, the fearfulness, the doubt. His love takes away all of that fear. Like, if I ask God for this, is He just going to, like, slam the door or smash me? Or if I ask Him to forgive me for that same sin one more time, it's just going to, the gavel's just going to come down, guilty, and I'm done. But if we know God's love, it takes away our fear before Him, and it reassures our hearts. So as we know His love, and we extend it out to others, our hearts can be assured. If we know his love and we extend his love, we can have a confident heart. 
Now look at verse 22 again. It says, And whatever we ask, we receive from Him because, because we keep His commandments and do what pleases Him. So this is the other half of a committed walk. Not just having an uncondemned, confident, assured heart, but here's where the actual walking comes in. Out of the overflow of God's love for us that assures our hearts as it spills out into our love for others, out of that overflow comes a pleasing obedience to God. A pleasing obedience to God. Because we keep His commandments and we do what pleases Him. If you're walking with the Lord, keeping His commandments, doing what pleases Him, you can have confidence before God. I'm obeying God. I'm walking with God. God is pleased with me. And therefore, I can go with confidence before a God who is pleased with me, not one that I think might not be so pleased. Maybe He still has some condemnation left for me. No, if I'm walking with Him, I can have confidence. And John tells us exactly what this obedience looks like in verse 24. I'm sorry, verse 23. He tells us in verse 23. And this is His commandment. Okay, great. <laughs> he didn't leave it undefined. Just obey. Obey what? Give me, can you narrow it down? Yes, I can narrow it down. And this is His commandment. That we believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as He has commanded us. So in a way, it's very simple and very hard. It's just two things. It's just the two hardest things. <laughs> believe in Jesus and love like Jesus. Believe in Jesus and love like Jesus. That's what a committed walk looks like. It looks like faith and love. Faith and love. Faith in Jesus, love for your neighbor. Faith in Jesus, love for your neighbor. Believe in Jesus and love like Jesus. That's a committed walk. Look at chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. John says, In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins, the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. There it is. Faith in the Father who gave us His Son to be the atoning sacrifice that spares us and rescues us from the coming wrath on the last day. He averts it so that it does not fall on you. That's a propitiation. It averts God's wrath so it does not fall on you. It takes away all your sins so there's no grounds left for the condemnation. There's no grounds left for the sin to be condemned. There's no grounds left for the wrath to fall. It's averted. You've been spared. You've been rescued. God sent His Son to be that sacrifice for your sins by His own blood. And He laid down His life for you as an example, as a model, as a measure and a standard for how you ought to then go and love your neighbor and love one another in self-sacrificing ways that puts their good ahead of yours. So you believe this gospel. You trust in this Jesus. You know the love of God in Christ. It melts your heart. It gives you that assurance. And then you turn and you seek to walk in all the ways that please the Lord, obeying Him, which fundamentally comes down to love God and love your neighbor. Believe in Jesus and love like Jesus. And if we do this, we can have an assured, confident heart, a committed walk, leads to a confident prayer life. Verse 24, whoever keeps his commandments, which is believe in Jesus and love like Jesus, whoever keeps his commandments abides in God, and God abides in him. 
So if I'm being obedient, I can know God is abiding in me and I am abiding in Him. If we know, if you know that you are believing what God wants you to believe, and if you know that you are obeying what God wants you to do, then you can know with a confident, uncondemned, assured heart that you are pleasing to the Lord. The Westminster Shorter Catechism asks, what do the Scriptures principally teach? What's the Bible ultimately about? And it answers by saying, the Bible's ultimately about what God wants you to believe and what God wants you to do. At the end of the day, it's what am I supposed to believe and what am I supposed to do? There's a lot of other stuff in the Bible, but that's why it's mainly given for, to tell us what our faith should be and what our lives should look like, how to believe and how to obey. And if you are con- believing what He wants you to believe and you're doing what He wants you to do, you, that's a committed walk, and you know that's pleasing to the Lord because He says so in His Word. It's not guesswork. It's not just you going, well, I hope this is something God will like. No, you have a word of God that you're obeying and believing. And you can take it to the bank. God says, believe this and do this. I'm believing that and doing that. God is pleased. This is a committed walk. To those who have this committed walk, God's ears are open to their prayers. God's ears are open to your prayers. He says, in our passage, he says, we have confidence before God because we keep His commandments and do what pleases Him. But what if you are unsure, not about God's love, what if you're unsure, not about God's promises, what if you're unsure that you have a committed walk? What if you turn inward and you start examining your faith, and is it strong enough, is it Is it pure enough? Is it sincere? And you start examining your faith. Or what if you start looking at your love and start thinking, man, it's cold, it's inconsistent. I like loving these people and not those people. My faith is weak or small. My love is up and down. I'm not always that obedient. In fact, I find myself more disobedient than obedient sometimes. What do you do if you're told, well, just have this committed walk and you can have assurance? Well, I don't feel like I have a committed walk. I mean, I'd love to have a more committed walk, but I mean, my goodness, my faith isn't where it needs to be. My, my obedience isn't where it needs to be. My love's not where it needs to be. What about me? What if you have no assurance about whether you really have a committed walk? Sincere faith and honest obedience from the heart. That's a problem that all of us deal with to some extent sometimes. We have no assurance. And John has something to encourage you today, dear Christian. Look at verse 24. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this we know that He abides in us by the Spirit whom He has given us. Point one is, how do you have a confident prayer life? You need to have a committed walk with the Lord. If you're not walking with the Lord, don't expect anything from the Lord. Have a committed walk. But if you're not sure about that committed walk, you need this other thing. In fact, regardless of how sure you are, you need this other piece Because we cannot work up enough confidence on our own. We're too fickle, we're too shallow, we're too inconsistent. We live contradictory lives where we are sincere about obedience over here, and then two hours later we're sincere about sin. (laughs) And we just, 
We're just, that's what sin does. It makes us into these walking contradictions where we just transgress our own standards, never mind God's. If you're just, if you're like this, if we're like this in our sin, we need this second piece. How to have confidence in your prayer life before God. You need to have a committed walk, but perhaps even more importantly, you need to have a convincing spirit. You need to have the Holy Spirit. You need God to tell you. You don't just need those voices in your head to tell you or your own heart to try and convince yourself. You need God by an external word in Scripture and by an internal testimony of the Holy Spirit to give your heart that sweet peace and assurance with Him that only He can give. That's why I'm so glad John just didn't just stop with, well, just go obey better and then you'll have more confidence. Great. <laughs> no, he said, and by this we know that God abides in us by the Spirit whom He has given. God has given, a, given us a convincing spirit. It's a gift. It's a supernatural gift to have this kind of assurance and confidence before God. Our sin and our enemy will distort and twist and try to keep you doubtful, fearful, ineffective, and useless to the kingdom. He wants you to stay in that rut until the day you drop. If he, can, if he can't keep you from being saved, he's going to keep you being the most ineffective, shaky, useless Christian he can. And he knows your weak spots, and he knows how to twist the truth. He's very good at it. But the one who is in you is greater than he who is in this world, as John will say later in this letter. The testimony of the Spirit can overcome those lying, deceiving voices and testimonies from the world or your guilty conscience or from the enemy or from your flesh. You need the Holy Spirit to tell you. And God gives us the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has been sent specifically to convince you that you are a child of God and to reassure your heart with confidence. We know this from verse 20. John knows you're out there, doubtful Christian. Verse 20, For whenever our heart condemns us, as it often does, God is greater than our heart, and He knows everything. You don't know. Maybe you don't know about your, how committed your walk is. Maybe you don't know how pleasing you are to God. Maybe you don't know about God's love the way you could or should. Maybe you don't know, and so your heart condemns you before God. But God knows. And because God knows, He can tell you with authority and infallible certainty that you belong to Him. God can tell you He's greater than your heart. Listen to God, not your heart. Chapter 4, verse 13. By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us because He has given us of His Spirit. We know because God tells us, and God tells us by the internal testimony of the Holy Spirit, working with the Word and working with our own walk with the Lord. Or as Paul says in Romans 8, the Holy Spirit bears witness, testifies with our own spirit that we are children of God. And if, if children, then heirs, joint heirs with Christ, heirs of the kingdom. That's one of the Spirit's main jobs is to give you assurance of your own salvation, to give you assurance that you're walking with the Lord, to give you assurance that you're pleasing to God, to give you assurance that you're His, and to give you that confidence to come to Him and ask to make a bold request for him, before Him. You can come to a God who has given His Son for you as Paul says, how will he not also, along with Jesus, give you everything that you need? Trust in Jesus. Believe in the gospel. Walk in obedience. Live in love and listen to the testimony of the Holy Spirit. And you will have a confident heart before God. 
And that brings us to our last point. Once you have a committed walk, once you have the testimony of the convincing Holy Spirit of God speaking to your heart, quieting your heart, giving you that assurance you need, then you'll be able to make a confident request. And this is what John alludes to in in verse 22. He says, Whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments and do what pleases Him. We have confidence before God, and whatever we ask, we receive from Him. Now, that's incredible. Whatever we ask, we receive. You know, start praying for, you know, a lottery ticket, or start praying for, you know, your favorite car, pray for the, pray for the next Eagles game. I mean, anything we ask? Really, God? You want to nuance that a little bit? Very open-ended. Makes me think of the, um, the movie uh, Bruce Almighty, where Jim Carrey is God, <laughs> and he decides to hit automatic on people's prayer requests so that they just, it's just an automatic auto-reply yes to whatever their prayer requests are. And so there's one lady who says, I lost 80 pounds on the Krispy Kreme diet. <laughs> Amazing. Is that what's going on here? Well, no, it's not. And we know that because the Bible doesn't just leave us with one verse hanging like that. We get whatever we ask for once we have that committed walk and we're convinced by the testimony of the Spirit. We want to believe what God wants us to believe. We want to do what God tells us to do. And if that's our heart then we are going to get everything we ask for because we're going to start asking for what God wants. Because your heart will be attuned to the things of God, you will have what you seek because what you seek will be what God seeks. What you want and what God wants will begin to align. And asking for that, you know, convertible or asking for that lottery ticket or asking for, you know, that parking space or asking for, you know, you'll get past all that stuff and you'll start really digging into the will of God. God, what do you want? That's what my heart wants. God, grant me the desires of my heart and may my desires be what you want them to be. John explains this a little further in... Chapter 5, towards the end of the letter, verses 13 to 15. John says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence, confidence that we have toward Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of Him. And there's the key. We will be asking for things that are according to His will, not ours. And in all the things that we ask, we we don't have to verbally say it, but in our minds at least, we have to be thinking, Lord, according to Your will, if this is part of your plan, because I want your will to happen. I have things I'd like to see happen, but I more want your will to happen, even if your will contradicts mine. And it's a way of just taking your will and asking for things before God confidently, but then subordinating your will to God's and saying, not mine, but thine. And you get your heart under the authority of God's word and his will and his ways And then you'll see the way you pray change and what you pray for will change. And then we'll see God moving in supernatural ways. So, Christian, cultivate a confident heart before God. Know His love. Look at His love on display on the cross Believe in Jesus. Trust in the gospel. The promises of God guaranteed the blood of His own Son. 
And let that begin to assure you. And let that love begin to melt your heart and give you a passion to go and love like Jesus did. Because if he so loved me, man, I can't keep it to myself. I've got to go and extend it to him. And I've got to walk in obedience. And I want to obey the Lord. I want to have a committed walk. Cultivate that heart out of which flows your obedience and your love and your faith. And pray boldly for the things of Christ. Pray confidently. Pray boldly for the will of God and the things of Christ. You can have a confident prayer life this year. The Word tells us how to do it. Let us believe and obey. Let's pray. Father, we do ask that you would work this miracle in our hearts, that we would indeed see ourselves begin to change in 2023, that we would see our hearts change in our minds and our attitudes and our motives and our wants and likes and dislikes, that we would begin to be moved at the impulse of your love, that our will would be conformed to yours, that your gospel would ring so true in our hearts that we'd be overcome with confidence before you, that we would begin to go into our prayer closets and into our prayer groups and our discipleship groups and wherever it is that we pray alone or with family or with friends and fellow believers, that we would just begin to move and run to prayer and begin to call upon you with boldness and confidence to the one who is able to do more than we could ever ask or think that we'd be hungry for prayer, that we would see your mighty hand at work as we pray, that we, would take, that we would take the opportunities we have at the church to come and pray or to meet with other believers and pray and begin to cultivate this boldness and confidence in prayer together and to begin to keep track and see how you're moving, see how you're working. And as we do that, Lord, we want to see your hand so that we can give you more and more and more praise, more credit, more glory. Lord, stagger us. Stagger us with the kind of prayer life that we didn't know was possible this year. As we walk with a committed, confident heart, and we believe all you call us to believe, and we seek to do all you've called us to do, give us this boldness. And may we listen always to the convincing testimony of the Holy Spirit, even when our hearts condemn us. Let us hear your voice and yours alone. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.